But Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Oh, okay. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. So I have absolutely no idea how this is going to work. This week when I gave a, I guess, two lectures to Slee on Marx, some of you may have heard them, some not, was my first experience with this newfangled contraption, this app called Zoom. So I, I found it very strange. So we'll, we'll have to um, figure it out as we go along. So I'm going to start today by saying some general things about what I hope we will talk about in the course of this quarter. And then I'll go on to, um, on to uh, the more specific question of why, why I chose uh, Camus' The Plague to begin with. You'll all think it was because of the title. And certainly the title was part of it, but not the, not the entire reason. OK. So <clears throat> the original idea for getting together, <clears throat> excuse me, for getting together uh, a group of people to talk at this particular time, to think out loud with each other, in other words, to engage in conversation. And I think we, somehow we have to figure out how to do that. We need to engage in conversation about a topic that really is very important for us to pursue. And I want to emphasize conversation precisely because I don't know how we're going to do it in this context. Uh, Greg has some ideas. But the point is that we are facing a series of issues, a set of issues that each of us sitting wherever we sit by ourselves and think about is insufficient to the requirements of the moment. Uh, thought is not simply taking place inside our own heads. Thought develops and takes place as Socrates hath taught us. Thought takes place in the process of people talking to each other, challenging each other, interrupting each other, fighting with each other over ideas. Hopefully fighting with ideas so they don't have to fight with other weapons. That's something for us to think about as well. The topic is, <clears throat> is extremely broadly, of course, the question of social democracy and democratic socialism. And I think it's ironic that on the one hand, this topic is made all the more acute, all the more important as a focus of conversation by the pandemic crisis in which we find ourselves. And it's that crisis that on every hand makes conversation about the important topics almost impossible. We have to be distanced from each other. And yet it is our collective existence that is the topic of our conversation. And so I think there's, a, there's an incredible dichotomy there, an incredible contradiction there, which is going to make it very difficult for us, not just now, but if you think about it, the, the projections for how long this crisis may go on, it isn't a matter of 48 hours or 72 hours. It could be a matter of two or three weeks or four weeks or months that our social relationships and therefore our intellectual relationships will change. We don't yet know how, I think, really to deal with this kind of issue in the kind of society we live in. Uh, we're accustomed, <clears throat> particularly those of us who are involved in our activity, that is in, 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 in universities, and particularly in the humanities side of the universities. Uh, we're conducted and we're, we're, we're used to thinking about ideas such as, I can be in conversation with Plato. But of course, when you come down to it in reality, we're not in conversation with Plato. Unfortunately for all of us, Plato isn't at the other end of whatever internet connection. Someday perhaps, uh, but at the moment that isn't quite possible. He's not at the other end of, the, of this internet connection. We're in conversation with Plato inside our own heads. 
and we're in conversation with Plato to the extent that you and I talk about Plato. And we try to think together about his ideas. And that's precisely what our physical condition at the present moment makes impossible. <clears throat> so one of the issues that we need to deal with as a community, intellectuals need to deal with as a community, in my opinion, is how to think about new forms of interaction and new forms of communication that will make it possible for us to deal in the, to deal with the give and take of conversation about important subjects. You know, this is not calling my grandmother and saying, how are you feeling today, grandma? I mean, we want to talk about freedom, about liberty, about democracy, about, about human welfare, human well-being. And this requires thinking through talking. That's not a lecture, by the way. I mean, that's part of, I can easily give you a lecture. It's not a lecture. The problem is to think about how to engage in conversation. The conversation on social dem democracy and democratic socialism becomes even more cogent um, in my mind uh, when we begin to understand that this pandemic is taking place in the midst not just of a medical phenomenon, but also in the midst of an economic, a social, a political, an intellectual crisis. And indeed, the, the phenomenon of this app pandemic is much more complex than just the medical question, which is, of course, complex in and of itself. But this is a pandemic that involves us in an economic crisis, social, political, intellectual crisis, that are almost as important as the medical significance of it all. And I say almost as important because obviously, if we fail medically and we're all dead, then the political and the social and the economic are not very relevant. But up to the point that we're all dead, as long as there are more than one of us that survive this crisis, so to speak, then we are involved in a multi-layered, multi-dimensional crisis far beyond just the medical situation. So I, I think as long as we stay alive with some hope of returning to a social existence that involves more than the mechanisms necessary for the distribution of face masks and medical equipment, then we need to engage in this conversation more than ever. This conversation itself about alternatives to the present, this conversation becomes incredibly acute and should be part and parcel of our daily thinking about it. Not only what kind of society does, say, keeping a distance mean, you know, <clears throat> I'm very struck by this idea that we should knock elbows instead of shake hands. So recently, even the knocking of elbows, you have to get closer than six feet in order to knock an elbow unless you have some incredible physical dimension that I don't have. Uh, so it's not even a matter of no longer shaking hands. This question of a society of distance, imagine a culture in which you're supposed to keep six feet away from each other. There is a wonderful article which I would bring to your attention in this morning's New York Times on how sex workers have been adjusting to this question of keeping six feet different, six, six feet distance from their customers. It's very, very important and very well worth thinking about. Thinking about sex work is not something we would normally do in a course other than sociology or a course on epidemiology. But it's a political question now because how you keep it, how you have a society in which that form of labor, labor remains possible, whether it should be or not is up to your own personal taste, but in which it is a form of labor that depends upon intimacy, not upon distance. So if you imagine a society in which for the next many years, we would have to keep six feet difference between us, there goes one form of labor, and I could undoubtedly mention many other kinds of labor that would disappear and which would, would radically change the way in which our society defines itself and functions. So I think that, <clears throat> that, that that's not 
a humorous example, but it is a, a, an example that might appear trivial in other terms, but which is incredibly symbolic of the kind of issues that we need to face. There are three lines, in my opinion, that have already been drawn in this conversation that we're talking about. Three sets of assumptions that, that, um, that need to be discussed and that define the, the camps from which we come or to which we belong. First, there is the assumption that the crisis, that once this, that once this medical crisis diminishes, we, the United States, indeed the whole world for that matter, will return to something called normal. To something that we were before. And if you're a free market optimistic ideologue, maybe like the President of the United States, who I think is more a free marketeer ideologically than politically, that image, that line that you would follow would be one that would lead to a reborn America, the new world, which will emerge from all of this, will be the same as the previous one, only more so. Make America great again. That's the line that the, the uh, president pursues. Make America great again. We once were great, now we'll be great again. And in fact, in the last week or two, as this election campaign melds into the pandemic, he, he says more and more often that we'll get an even, we'll get a new burst of energy. We'll even be greater than we were when we were great. So that's one line of thought. It will be a world the same as the past, but injected with an enormous amount of pent up energy that is repressed now because of this pandemic. Since the right wing, the party of Trump and his followers displays little faculty for irony. One cannot but note that there's a great deal of the government's policy and practice that has been a reassertion of the free market system today, the playing off. And this to me is very important to think about. What the pandemic has resulted in is a policy based on, the, on, the, on carrying the free market concept to its furthest extreme of playing off human health, even life, against other human lives, against other ways of attacking the problem of human health in a competitive market, defined at least theoretically in the sense that neoliberals have been defining it. This idea that the states, for example, should be competing with each other in order to get masks, in order to get all the necessary equipment to fight the pandemic. This, the idea that competition would naturally occur in an effort to save human lives. Competition means some win, some lose. And it has to do not with the human will, but with your resources, your cleverness, Right? All of those things that go into the, into the metaphysics, if you will, of a market economy are being brought into play institutionally by the way in which the American government is handling this. And it's not just doing it in the United States, it's doing the same internationally so that it is competing together or against other countries for limited resources in order to save lives. Another article in one of the newspapers, I don't recall which, uh, remarks how in this, in this market economy of human welfare that the pandemic has created, the poorer countries simply do not have the wherewithal to compete with the bigger companies, bigger countries. The poorer countries do not have the wherewithal to compete with the bigger countries for the resources necessary to fight the, the, the uh, epidemic. So there's a great deal of contradiction. This, this, this idea of the market as a determinant factor in how we survive 
who has the ability to survive, is in very sharp contradiction with a more broadly universalistic feeling we have that all human beings have an equal right to health. You'll notice that, the, that, that those people who've been arguing, for example, uh, for a single payer health system or for a national health system, which I certainly would support 100%. The counter to that argument is never a, a principled argument in terms of human welfare. Uh, nobody ever comes along and says, well, it is more moral to have a system uh, of private enterprise in health, right, and a competitive system in health rather than a, um, a single payer. The, the, the argument is always costing what is the most efficient way to deliver health to people. And, and that's the kernel of the argument between the left and the right in the United States. But the argument as we're perceiving it today, at least in my opinion, has a profound moral component to it, which we're not facing up to. And that is the ethics of the marketplace as opposed to the ethics of human welfare. And I think that that contradiction, that distinction has to be brought to the fore and made part of our discussion about political theory, social theory, about ethics and the ethics of the capitalist system as we are experiencing it today. In the middle and on the left, that is among liberals, and leftists, I want to argue, there's also a certain confusion of values or a certain confusion of thought, uh, though it is of a very different kind. The major issue of the moment with the liberals on the left, <clears throat> were it not a pandemic, would be the presidential election, which we can only hope will in fact take place as planned and scheduled in November. That itself is something that needs to be striven for now. Until the pandemic, however, the primary campaign seems to have been conducted, and I say this from a very, very subjective perspective, mostly with slogans. The slogans were primarily of two different kinds. On the one hand, the liberal, uh, there were slogans that were intended to define the Trump era as a deviation from the normal development, as an exception to the American concept of democracy and way of life. And those slogans can and do continue because they are the center of our, of our campaign. Those slogans seem to promise a return to the comfort of the stability of the pre-Trump pre era. They are a very conservative perspective on the present, so that the past becomes a, an aspired for future, which by the way, structurally in many ways, imitates Trump's own arguments because Trump also is holding out the aspiration for the future of a past, which may never have existed of course, but that's what he's doing. On the left, on the other hand, the campaign of slogans held out the hope for the amelioration of specific conditions. Say health, the argument over, over the, the structure of healthcare. Education, for giving loans and things of that sort, free access to higher education, so forth and so on. But these were slogans which appeared with, <clears throat> to suggest important programmatic ideas, but which were not really linked to important programmatic ideas. They weren't linked to the, to the question of the fundamental organization of society itself. It is this, and I'm trying to say this in somewhat different terms, it is as if the introduction of a single payer system, a national health system, would be simply put into our society and we would all get health distributed more democratically and more equally. But it didn't attach that idea to the question of restructuring the fundamental fundamentals of society itself. 
<clears throat> let me let me let me show you what I mean. We all experience health individually. Now, today, we are beginning to talk about public health in social terms. The idea this is a pandemic, the idea that we spread it from each other. So here is individual health. I don't want to get the the uh, the virus. You don't want to get the virus. So we are socially affected by this. So we keep our distance six feet from each other. That will have an effect on other forms of social existence than just the health question. And it's at that level that we need to ask our questions. We need to think about how will the family, what should the proper family be? How should a family be properly structured in an age in which we now know what we know about health and the relationship of health to society and so forth? Can you keep the family as it is and simply introduce national health on top of it? Or does the relationships within the family have to change? What about gender relationships? We fight all, or, or, or race, class. We fight each of these battles separately. But what this health situation seems to be showing us is that they're not individual separate battles. They are all social battles and must be rooted in some kind of vision of society itself. Everybody has been surprised. And I admit that I have been thinking about this also once it was brought to our attention, attention, about the fact that black and brown people suffer more deaths than white people do from this virus. It's very interesting to think about this. Up to a point, about three days ago, maybe four days ago, there was no discussion of that issue of ever. All of a sudden, it got injected in the conversation, and now <clears throat> it's central to our thinking that race, and by the way, gender is now being introduced as well, race and gender are a function of health in this thing, or rather that health is a function of race and gender in this situation, which means that we have to deal with <clears throat> those fundamental questions of race, gender, et cetera, et cetera, in order to deal with the health question. There's not one, there are many, all intricately involved with each other. And then I'll go one step further. What kind of, what, how do we understand human society in the face of this social complification of our individual existence, a, a social complification of a sort that we hadn't experienced before, hadn't thought about before. What should the relationships be, be between individual and individual? To what extent, for example, to put it in a very, very naked form, to what extent can the individual, with all the word individual entails, the kind of individualism that we that we participate in, the kind of individualism that makes the market system work, the idea that I will pursue my own self-interest and you your own self-interest, the ego at the center of my world and your ego at the center of your world, mediated by a non-human or inhuman or at least not a human instrument, the market, almost like a force of nature, to what extent can that idea of individualism, of egocentrism, which is what it is, can it, can, can, can it continue to exist if we are going to face socially the kind of extraordinary complex problems that this epidemic shows us we are facing? So that then raises a, 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 the fundamental question, very fundamental question, of the nature of human relationships and also of education itself. What kind of personality, what kind of concept of myself should I be trying to impart to my grandchildren and my children in the course of schooling? If they grow up, into the same world that I'm living in, 
with the same kind of egocentrism that is characteristic of my society today, of my culture today. How will they deal with an epidemic in the future? How will they deal with the threats to future life? And to make this even more scary, because I, I do think it's a scary issue, scary in an existential way, not that I hide in the corner because I'm afraid of a ghost, scary in a really existential way. And this question has been raised marginally so far, but not dealt with frontally. What does this epidemic and the questions that I'm trying to get you to think about, what does this say to us about the environment? Because ultimately, even if this epidemic is resolved, we're still going to face the problem of environmental degradation and the threat of environmental degradation to the nature of human life, to the nature of our society, and so forth and so on. Can we solve, can we find a solution to the environmental problem that doesn't entail radical restructuring of society from the concept of the, of the individual up through the family structure, participation in the family structure, and so forth and so on. Uh, at the other end of the, of, of, the, of the ladder, as it were, at the greatest era of generalization, another set of articles in the press recently has been pointing out how nationalism interferes with solving the medical problem of this pandemic. The idea of the nation state, which we take with almost without thinking as the fundamental institution of global society. We organize our trade internationally, that is between nation states and so forth and so on. But that concept of the nation state, the reality of the nation state has been interfering in the sharing of scientific knowledge, of statistics, et cetera, competition between the nation states, for example, has been interfering in the sharing of the kind of knowledge and experience that overcoming this threat to human life that the, that the pandemic represents is all about. So where is the human institution? Where is the, is the definition of human nature that we do not have to call into question at this point as a result of the pandemic, which is why I think the pandemic is an excellent opportunity to raise uh, all of these questions. It exposes the assumptions that we operate with and the weaknesses that we face. Okay, I'll make a few more points. I think it's not by chance and those of you who know me know my prejudices. I think it's not by chance that the Scandinavian countries, and because of Bernie Sanders, Denmark in particular, seem to have come to stand, regardless of their reality, as an alternative, better way of life than, say, we have here in America. And by better, I mean precisely what I said before, what I was trying to get at before, a culture a society, a way of life that is more conducive to human well-being than free market capitalism of the kind that we experience, however hedged in it is by certain particular conditions. It's very curious that in, inside Scandinavia, if any of you have followed this in face of the epidemic, they have been trying different routines. Uh, the Swedes have been following until very recently the policy of, of the herd, that everybody should get a little bit of the virus and then the problem ceases to exist. The uh, Danes and Norwegians have been locking people down the way we are. Um, quite opposite policies. They, they are, as it were, as has been pointed out, as, as if they had done this on purpose. It wasn't done on purpose, but as if they had they provided a laboratory of different methods of approaching the pandemic. But the point is that they all start from the same perspective, and that is human well being. Whereas Donald Trump is saying, and if you heard the news last night, Attorney General Barr, that great epidemiologist, uh, 
has raised the, uh, the, the, the question of whether more lives will be lost by keeping the economy closed than by letting the virus perhaps run a little bit freer. You know, the president says, well, if you think of all those people who are going to commit suicide because they can't go to work, maybe that number will be greater than the number of people who will die when we give up social distancing. So therefore, if that's the kind of calculus we want to engage in, we can open up the economy at the end of April. And it's, I'm sorry that some of you are going to die, but fewer of you will die in an open economy than will die in a controlled epidemiological situation. That kind of thinking, very typical in my opinion of where we are today, that kind of thinking needs to be dealt with and dealt with in a very strong way. And we can only do it by going back and examining fundamentals. All right. I said that what we want to talk about this quarter is social democracy and democratic socialism. And I want to try to draw for purposes of conversation the distinction between them. That my distinction between them, and I admit this is my subjective distinction, but maybe it's useful in order to conduct a conversation. The difference is between amelioration on the one hand and institutional and social restructuring on the other, and that's a huge difference. For our purposes, for my purposes, I think I would argue that amelioration assumes the validity of the basic concepts upon which our social and political culture are based. While institutional and social restructuring question those very concepts in order to define a new foundation upon which to build institutions and processes that will more than just marginally improve human well-being. So amelioration implies institutional, I'm going to prejudice my argument, institutional fiddling on the margins, while restructuration implies going down to the very basics and asking again those fundamental questions that were asked, for example, during the period of the of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, basic definitional questions. It's this, I think, that defines the difference between social democracy and democratic socialism. We have been talking about introducing a national health system without talking about the family, without talking about individualism, without talking about those values. Western Europe and Northern Europe introduced after World War One, after World War II, but by the way, in some areas long before that, in Germany, even before World War I, something akin to what we would understand as socialized medicine. Britain introduces this in 1946, but it's already been planned during the Second World War. That fundamental change, think about what this means. This means that a whole class of work now changes from being private enterprise to being a social enterprise. Doctors will now tend to be working for the state or for some other social mechanism, not working for their own private profit. That's a fundamental shift, a fundamental change, which has, if it's thought through, ramifications for many other areas of society. So that, for example, <clears throat> once I admit the possibility that certain kinds of activity, fundamental activities, such as medical care delivery, needs to be socialized. And by socialized, I don't mean now in a rather trite way, state organization, but somehow has to be taken out of the domain of private initiative and reoriented to social objectives and thought of in terms of social organization. Then I can ask myself, and this is what has happened in, 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 in uh, Western Europe, Northern Europe, and England, what other areas of human activity should be socialized as opposed to left to private enterprise? In the period after the Second World War in England, once the decision was made, of course, 
the decision was made to introduce national health. The decision was made as part of the general orientation that that involved to introduce, to, to nationalize other basic services that were necessary to well-being among those transportation, say the railroads. Um, until Margaret Thatcher came along, that included such things as fundamental production. Um, why should those items that we all need to exist, material, certain kinds of matter, iron, uh, coal, we need coal, or at least we used to, we need coal to keep ourselves warm. All human beings have a right to be warm. Therefore, why should warmth be subject to the private interests of some and not others? Shouldn't it be socialized? Just the way health should be a human right, so warmth should be a, a in a cold climate, should be uh, socialized. Or we can think about something like electricity or any kind of energy. Energy which we need to survive, which we need to produce the goods which everybody requires, should those not morally be governed by society itself rather than by some non-human or non-social institution like the market, which is conceived of under capitalism as a kind of force of nature, an institution in which humans participate but do not make. That's the difference between democratic socialism and social democracy. Democratic socialism says, yes, we need to make these fundamental changes. We need to reconsider from the scratch the nature of our institutions and of ourselves, whereas social democracy calls for amelioration, for improvement on a kind of piecemeal basis. You, you all know where I come down on all of this, that I'm quite, quite prejudiced, but I think nonetheless, it, it gives us a basis to start talking. Let me then uh, add a couple more points and then I want to say something about the rest of the course. There are other choices we could make. Social democracy and democratic socialism are not the only choices we could make. There is, of course, the choice we can make to go on as we're going. That's, uh, that's a given. Uh, that's the given that indeed people like Trump hold out. And even I think that the, that the Democratic Party as a party is holding out for us today. There's also a, a right wing, very consistent, very rational position, and that's fascism. Uh, we tend to denigrate fascism for a whole variety of reasons, historical, emotional, ethical, but we have to be able to understand that the fascist position, which I would define as a position that says the state is society, and the state is the absolutely necessary instrument for governing society, and we must define ourselves and our activities in terms of the state that that position is also a very rational position given the realities that we confront today. Imagine a United States, a fascist United States, leaving aside the pejoratives that immediately spring to our mind, but just think of it structurally. A state which had the power to dictate, perhaps based upon fear, but to dictate that everybody do A and not B. And if you don't do A, off with your head. We would probably solve the pandemic crisis as quickly as the Chinese appear to have done so. That's a rational choice. And I don't mean to make it a major option for us to talk about in this conversation, but I think nonetheless that we have to give it some credence in our conversation and to understand why there are people uh, who pursue that objective. The, um, the populace in Europe are not all of them out of their minds. They're not all skinheads running around slobbering. Some of them, 
have good arguments to make, not our arguments, not my arguments, but arguments that we need to consider. All right, let me now then turn to the course immediately or the discussion, whatever, and, and, and tell you why I chose the books that we're beginning with. Obviously, Camus is the Plague <clears throat> has a title and a subject, which is tailored <laughs> made for almost anything we would want to talk about uh, beginning in this month of April in 2020. But it has a historical role and it makes an argument about a subject, which is where I think we need to begin. The subject that it deals with really is the nature of our responsibility for each other. And I know it's getting uh, kind of late already. So we'll start, I wanna propose that we start actually talking about the book next time. And I will actually try to introduce a discussion of the book next time. Uh, but the point is it, it, it raises in a very literate and very aesthetic way this question of our responsibility for each other and our responsibility for history, for what happens. This book and other things, but this book is a good talisman, a good central point, is the book that broke apart the friendship, an historical friendship, a friendship that was a matter of constant public display in Paris in the years right after World War I, World War II between Camus on the one hand and Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir on the other, the, the three great intellectuals of the immediate post-World War II period. Sartre and following, followed by de Beauvoir tended, as time went on, to be more open to the communist response to the crisis of that age. That is to the idea that revolution was necessary that the only way that human welfare could be improved would be through a radical, perhaps violent, overturning of all existing institutions. And because of that, and of the necessity of the state as such, as the primary instrument for that overturning, that bouleversement of society, Sartre's position towards the Soviet Union, towards communism, tended to be more understanding, not necessarily enthusiastic, but at least more tolerant than Camus. Camus was saying, wait a minute, we have to raise the issue of human relations, of what it means to be a human being. The, we are not simply the subject of history, we are also the authors of history, not just the objects of history, we are also the authors of history. We make history. Therefore, if we make history, if we believe that human beings have a right to make history, that it's in their nature indeed to make history, then we have to talk about what a human being should be. And because of that debate between the, the, the the conversation on what a human being should be, what a humane society should be on the one hand, and what are the demands of history on the other side. This great friendship between Camus and Sartre fell apart. And I think that the plague, along with the other book that I recommended you peruse, The Rebel, uh, The Rebel being a more philosophical reflection, the plague an aesthetic reflection of the point that Camus wants us to think about. Camus is, 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 is saying, don't think about the dialectic, that's not the issue. Class struggle, that's not the issue. The issue is what kind of day by day human society we want and what kind of human being should we be, should we be. So if you go to the very first pages of the plague, where he's describing the city of Oran in North Africa, where this plague is going to take place, you'll notice that he's describing the city in very flat terms. That city is, a, is the city of cities. 
There are no great marquees, no great towers. There's nothing fantastical about that city. He intends you to, he intends to put you in a situation where the city is the city is the city and nothing more than the city. And then he says, now what happens when we introduce this fundamental question, this fundamental crisis in human relations, which is personified in the novel by the plague, it could be personified in our, in our apocalyptic films, for example, by an environmental crisis. The point is when you, when you put individuals who are nothing more than individuals, common people, scrabbling and making their living the way everybody does, doing what they do every day and every night, and then all of a sudden you introduce them into the kind of crisis situation we, are find, we find ourselves in one today, what happens? What makes you, what do you think about at that point? What values do you come up with? That's one way of positing the question. The other book that I wanted us to start with, and that <clears throat> I hope you'll read and get ready to discuss, in fact, we, we can dis begin discussing them in tandem next time, is Edmund Wilson's To the, to the Finland Station. Not enough people read to the Finland Station these days. It is a marvelously literate history of the run-up to the Russian Revolution, of the late 19th and early 20th century socialist revolt, socialist discourse about this question. And it, it, it achieves its final moment at the Finland Station, which is where, if you wanted to find a scene in which the Russian Revolution begins, it would be at the Finland Station. <clears throat> There's a very, very famous painting reproduced mechanically over and over and over in the old Soviet Union showing Lenin arriving at the Finland Station and giving that first rousing speech. It's, a, it's an image implanted in every Soviet mind. And I'll discuss the history of that when we get to it. But it is an exploration of the other form of the discourse. In other words, the plague is looking at it from the human point of view, from the question of human values. And to the Finland Station is looking at it from the point of view of a movement, a social movement, a revolutionary movement. And it's not playing off of those two ways of looking at the issue of social democracy and democratic socialism that I wanted us to get started with, period. <laughs>